Hello everyone, I'm Klaus Aranha from the University of Tsukuba and this is Experiment Design in Computer Sciences Week 3. In this video we will talk about the interpretation and validation of statistical tests, so let's go. In the last video we talked about how to calculate a statistical inference. Uh, a statistical inference. We described the result of the test as there is sufficient or insufficient evidence for rejecting the new hypothesis at a significance level alpha. This description is correct, but is incomplete. For example, we don't know how strong is the result found by the experiment, and we don't know how big was the difference observed between the new hypothesis and what we saw in the experiment, so or how sensitive was the test. So giving this all this extra information would make our analysis of the experiment much more useful, and that's what we're going to talk about in this video. So the first thing I want to talk about is the p-value, which I think some people have heard about. p-value is something that a lot of people use wrongly, though, so I want to try to explain this carefully. We define the p-value as the smallest value of alpha that would cause the calculation of the statistical test to reject the new hypothesis. So another way to think about it is that it's the highest possible confidence level that we can obtain for this test using the data that we found. For the last example in the previous video, we would cap calculate the p-value following this formula where the total probability like area in the t-distribution when the value of the t-statistic is smaller than minus 1.597. So we calculate this by getting an integral of minus infinity to uh, the value, the, the, to the value, so this would be the cumulative probability under this distribution and that would give us a value of 0 0.447. This 2 here is because we're using a two-tailed test. Okay? So, to reject the new hypothesis in this experiment, we would need a significance alpha of 0 0.1447. Okay? One nice way to interpret the p-value is how surprised we are to see this result under the new hypothesis. The lower the p-value, the more surprising is the result that we saw in the experiment. The p-value can be very useful since it quantifies how surprising the experiment result was. However, we need to be careful. For example, when you learn that the p-value measures the minimum alpha that rejects the new hypothesis, one thing that we naturally think is, okay, since the p-value calculated the minimum alpha, we don't need to decide alpha, we can just use the p-value. Well, that would be a wrong conclusion, because changing the value of alpha after we get the experiment data would be similar to moving the goalposts of the problem. We need to determine what confidence level we desire for this experiment before we look at the data. Another problem with relying too much on the p-value is that it's very easy to inflate the size of the p-value by manipulating the experiment design. For example, if we can increase the number of observations easily, we can reduce the p-value to a very small number, even if the difference between the new hypothesis and the true value is very small. So look at this example. The difference between the new hypothesis, the new hypothesis 500, and the data, the real data, is 499. So the difference is very, very small. It's even smaller than the error. But because we have a very big n, the p-value becomes a very small value, okay? So, in computer science, this is a very particular problem because in many cases we can artificially inflate n by using many, many simulations or a large number of cross-validation. 
okay? So to avoid this kind of problem, we can calculate something called an effect size estimator. Remember that the p-value calculates how surprised we are at a result, but it does not calculate the size of the result. The effect size estimator calculates the size of the result or how far away it is from the expected new hypothesis. We can calculate it by dividing the difference observing in the experiment by the error of the sample. Another way to improve our understanding of this result is to calculate confidence intervals together with the p-value in our report. The confidence interval also gives us the size of an estimated error and can be very useful to understand the result of an experiment. Okay, next I want to talk about different topic, model validation. If you pay attention to the lecture today, you can understand that the new hypothesis testing method that I have introduced depends on several assumptions about the problem that we are studying in the experiment. Some of these assumptions are statistical. Probably the ones that you can understand right away is that the estimated value follows a normal distribution. That's one assumption. Some of the assumptions, however, are from a technical point of view, in other words, about the setup of the experiment. For example, when we use the mean weight of the packages as our representative value, we are assuming that one package being under average is not a big problem, as long as the average of all the packages is correct. Note that this would be very different if we were not talking about chocolate, but if we were talking about, let's say, a medicine package. Okay? In that case, we would like to be sure that all vaccines, all medicine, have the minimum weight that is necessary to use. So then that would invalidate the test that we're doing. We would need a different test. Also, we are assuming that our observations come from the regular production of the factory, that they are not produced especially for this test. And there are other assumptions like this. Note that for this kind of technical assumptions, there is not much that we can do in terms of calculations or statistics. In this case, it's important to be aware of these assumptions so that we can prepare the experiment in order to make sure that the experiment assumptions are validated. We also have some statistical assumptions that are much more narrow in scope, but still important to consider. They refer to the properties that we assume for the underlying model of the statistical test. For this test, we are concerned with three assumptions. Assumption of normality, assumption of independence, assumption of variance. There are other assumptions depending on the test that we are using, that we're going to talk to them along this course. Today I want to talk about the assumption of normality which is the assumption that the distribution of the sample mean that we calculate is roughly normal. In other words, if we calculate the sample mean of many samples in many experiments, but from the same population, we will obtain a normal curve of these results. If you remember, the calculation of the Z statistic and the T statistic that we used in the last video use the normal curve or the student T curve to calculate the critical uh, the critical region, and that's why this assumption is necessary. Now, in most cases, the CLT guarantees that this assumption holds, but we can test it if necessary. To test the assumption of normality, we can use the QQ plot to, to visually inspect the distribution of the residuals of our observation data. The QQ plot, which means a quantile quantile plot, plots a set of data points on the horizontal axis and the theoretical value of a normal distribution in the vertical axis. If the data follows a normal distribution, the QQ plot will be roughly a straight diagonal bounded by these red dotted lines. This plot also helps us spot outliers in the data, so it's useful for that. If we do a QQ plot, the outliers become very obvious and you can examine them. We can also test the normal assumption using statistical tests. 
such as the Shapiro-Wilk test. These tests use the same idea of the hypothesis test, but here the new and alternate hypotheses are about whether the distribution is normal or not. Even if the CLT helps guarantee the assumption of normality, it's still very useful to investigate these characteristics of the data when analyzing the results of the experiment. To finish the lecture today, I want to talk about the assumption of independence because this one is a really important one. The assumption of independence says that the observations in a sample are independent from each other. This means that when we obtain observation X using the experiment, this does not influence the result of observation X plus 1 or X plus 2 or X plus 3. It's easy to explain with an example. Imagine that our experiment involves calculating the speed of a robot. So the robot has a battery. If you run the experiment 20 times, but do not recharge the battery of the robot, the robot will run slower and slower, and eventually it will stop. On the other hand, if you fill the battery every time before running the experiment, the robot will run always the same speed. Well, it does not depend on the amount of energy in the battery. So in this example, the assumption of independence is violated and the statistical test that we described would give us a bad result that is not reliable. So in general, it's not possible to guarantee or even test independence purely by mathematical tests. We have the Durbin-Watson test that can, de can detect a time-related dependence, such as the robot example that we gave, but this test does not work if the dependence is not time-dependent or if the order of the observations is scrambled. So, in practice, we need to design our experiment carefully to remove any factors that would violate the independence ass assumption. Okay, uh, this finishes the videos that I wanted to give you for this week. You will notice that we still have a few slides in the materials, and I highly recommend that you spend some time uh, doing the extra reading for this class. If you have any questions, as always, come to the office hours, and see you there.